ओम भद्रम खरने विश्रुनु या मदेवा भद्रम पश्ये माक्षभिर्यचत्रा स्थिरंगे स्तुष्टुवागुम सस्तनु व्यशेम देवाहित यदायु ओम शांति 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 Om, O gods, may we hear with our ears what is auspicious. O ye adorable ones, may we see with our eyes what is auspicious. May we sing praises to ye and enjoy with strong limbs and body the life allotted to us by the gods. Om, peace, peace, peace. <clears throat> The first step toward finding God, who is truth, is to discover the truth about myself. And if I have been in error, the first step to truth is the discovery of my error. The individual person is responsible for living his own life and for finding himself if he persists in shifting his responsibility to somebody else he fails to find out the meaning of his own existence life is not a problem to be solved but a mystery to be lived the meaning of life is found in openness to being and being present in full awareness good morning everyone morning. welcome to ramakrishna monastery those quotes are from thomas merton love him yeah he's awesome well today's topic is identifying the problem and the solution Mm, do we have a problem? We have many. <laughs> As if we didn't have enough, right? Who wants to talk about problems? But well, sometimes we have to be positive. Mm? If we have a problem, if we find a solution, it can change our lives. Mm? So, um, a few months ago, actually last month, right? I gave a talk on Vedanta and the 12 steps. Mm? And there we analyzed a little bit the nature of the problem of life from the Vedantic, Vedantic perspective and its solution. And also the parallels, and the connections between these Vedantic principles and the goal, its goal with the 12 steps program. Mm -hmm. And kind of jokingly, I said that um, we have to recognize the problem and the problem was that our life have become unmanageable and we need to do something about it which is more or less the first step of the 12 program, steps program why do i insist with this why our lives is unmanageable well because we don't know what our problem is and as long as we don't identify the problem, there is no solution. Therefore, it is unmanageable. We are wanting people. We want all the time. And sometimes we don't even know what we want. And all we want is to, is to stop wanting. That is clear. Hmm? So the problem is in me, and therefore the solution is also in me. I need to figure this out. Now let us try to analyze the nature of what we call the fundamental problem of life, according to Vedanta. When we analyze a problem, which basically is a matter, a situation we regard as 
unwelcome or harmful. And need to be deal, we need to deal with it, with this, and overcome the matter or situation. Yes, problems are situations that cause difficulty and stress. And usually we see problems as something negative. But hey, a problem could be welcome. As long as finding the solution to it will bring about positive changes in our lives. Don't you think? Meaning, the fact that what we call a problem today, it may be a blessing in disguise in the future. We have experienced this in our life. Hmm? Sometimes we say, why, 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 and all of a sudden, wow, there is light. You see the purpose. Hmm? There are two types of problems in life. A problem where its solution lies outside the problem. The usual one. And the other is a problem for which the solution is within the very problem. Again, a problem where its solution lies outside the problem. For example, problems of hunger, shelter, clothing. We need to find a solution outside. If we are hungry, what do we do? Hey, do you have anything to eat? Hmm? I need shelter. Hey, can I sleep overnight today in your house? Or you get your own house, your own home. Therefore, we seek the solution in ex an external situation. In analyzing situational problems in our life, social life, and in our national life, we need to take into account the resources at our disposal. Planning and effort. Planning and effort to embark ourselves in the solving of these problems. These problems where the solution lies outside the problem, and for most of them, whatever is in our control, Mm, they require planning and effort from our end. Is it in my control? Can I do something about it? Then, effort. Now, if it's not under your control, if it's just a fact of life, acceptance, which is difficult sometimes. What happens in the case of a problem where the solution lies within the very, the very problem itself? Can you imagine that? Yeah, there are lots. Remember when we were kids? I do, actually. We were given these geometric kind of puzzles, you know, that uh, I think they are called chunky puzzles. Mm -hmm with geometric shapes that you needed to kind of like locate or fit that specific wooden part into a specific shape, say the circle, triangle, or um, rectangle. And even though it was easy, you were like, as a kid, you were like, oh, what is this? And you, no, that didn't work, right? It was kind of hard to fit a circle shape into a rectangular one. Now, what is the solution to that? The problem itself. You need to analyze, use your mind, your discernment, and say, hey, this probably fits here. And boom. Or if you need somebody, the help of somebody, you just ask for help. And an enlightened person will come and help you out. Hmm? Here, the solution is within the problem, which means proper fitting or arrangements of the pieces. In the case of a jigsaw, for example, 
you know, you have all the parts, you have to put them together. Even then, while doing so, you may think, hmm, one part is missing. I'm sure one part is missing. But all it requires is proper arrangement. You know the solution is there. You have all the parts. You have to start again. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, if the solution is contained in the problem and yet remains a problem, then what do you think it is? It's purely ignorance. It's purely ignorance. The problem is caused by ignorance of a fact. The knowledge of a fact alone solves the problem. Today we are going to focus on these kind of problems. Mm -hmm. What is the problem of life? Is there any problem at all? Death, what else? Suffering. Suffering. Great Buddhism there. Yeah, we call it dukkha. Sorrow. No matter what. That doesn't seem to stop, huh? We keep looking for a solution. Mm -hmm. Trying to fit that kind of part, you know, in the right shape, but sorrow, anxiety, depression, sadness, that's the problem of life. Didn't you know that? The ups and downs, and when we are down there, hmm, we fall into a loop. Dangerous indeed. We have to help ourselves by our own selves. But that's okay. It happens to all of us in different degrees. Mm -hmm. Carl Jung had a hard time opposing the orthodox medical <coughs> dogma of his days, which was that the elite clung to the notion that anxiety disorders originate in alterations within the brain. Did you follow? Carl Jung, famous psychologist, psychiatrist, had a hard time opposing the orthodox medical dogma of his days, which was that the elite clung to the notion that anxiety, depression, disorders, all these disorders originate in alterations within the brain. Therefore, medication. Carl Jung believed that most cases of anxiety and depression are not the product of a faulty brain, but of a faulty way of life. The first step in Jung's method of treatment, therefore, was not drug prescription, but a dose of psychological insight. Really like this. Let us stop and think about it. That's what he says. Psychological insight. Insight regarding what we expect from life. Insight into what it takes to change. Young, Jung, excuse me. I wish I was young. <laughs> Jung noted that many people believe that life should be easy. Suffering kept to a minimum and difficulties avoided. We can sometimes believe that, right? Life should be easy. Why this is happening? Mm -hmm. And suffering, you know, all right, to the minimum. Mm -hmm. And let's just avoid problems. What? Is there any problem? I don't see it. Mm -hmm. But Jung would be honest with his patients, telling them that life is simply not easy. And this is for all of us. 
Life is a battleground. It always has been and always will be. And if it were not so, existence would come to an end, he says. In accepting that difficulties are inevitable and noting worth achieving and nothing worth achieving comes easy, would place us on the firm ground of reality from which to change in accepting that difficulties are inevitable and nothing worth achieving comes easy would place us on the firm ground of reality from which to change. For when we accept that life is hard, we will also realize that only through the strengthened character do we have any chance of living a good life? Understood? If, on the other hand, we remain caught in the delusion that life should be easy, we will be less motivated to overcome a weak character. As we will falsely hope that if we just give it time, life will get easier. Mm -hmm. We have enough experience. It doesn't. Indeed, as we know, life is not easy and problems in life, which will cause us pain and sadness, are unfortunately inevitable. Mm -hmm. Is the solution outside? Is the solution outside? We think the solution for sadness lies outside ourselves. We want to find a solution in the external world. That's all we have known. The outside factors need to be corrected or destroyed to remove the cause of our sadness or sorrow. Why are we sad? Because I don't have a job. Because I'm not married. Because I don't have kids. Mm -hmm. Because someone didn't call me and I was expecting that phone call this morning. We convince ourselves that the root cause of our sadness and sorrow is outside. And therefore the solution must come from the outside. In analyzing our assumption, we must conclude that finding a job, getting married, having kids will end our sadness. That's it. Maybe only for a moment, a honeymoon, <laughs> and then back again problem starts. Hmm? Indeed, it's beautiful to be able to thrive in life, finding the right job and to marry the one, and to have kids. But the solution is nothing but temporary. And guess what? It will create new problems. It may be that you decide to adopt an eight-year-old child who was brought up in an abusive environment and this had created deep psychological problems in him. And no matter how much love and attention you give to him or to this person, to this child, you find yourself with a new challenge and probably a very difficult one to set boundaries. And many of you know Educating a child is not easy. Speaking of which, um, I, I, I like when I read this many years ago. This is in Sri Ramakrishna's um, Words of Wisdom. He was speaking to somebody and um, all of a sudden he says, tell me, 
What does one, what does one attain through money? Jai Gopal Sen, he says, a gentleman, is such a wealthy man, but he complains that his children do not obey him. When I read this, I, I thought, wow, such an insignificant thing. But Sri Ramakrishna, I, I was wondering why he pointed it out, that to be important, his kids do not obey him. It's actually kind of deep, actually, if you go into the root of it. In the end, the solution to sadness caused by apparent external problems does not lie outside myself. But if we try to destroy sadness with something external, we will be confronted with new sources of sorrow and new challenges. These kind of solutions are nothing but a source of comfort. Hmm? Is it clear? Focusing on things that give you satisfaction and embracing new challenges consciously could be only a way to acquire some kind of comfort in life. Also, finding some kind of purpose, a role in our lives, can keep us going. True. Jung believed that when stuck in deep depression or consumed by an anxiety disorder, to be cured necessitates discovering a role as one of the actors in the divine drama of life. To understand what he meant by this, we need to analyze an encounter Jung had with a chief of the Pueblo tribe in the first half of the 20th century. Listen to this. Jung, discussing with this man the tradition of his tribe, when the chief made the following remark, was discussing this with the, this man. He said, yes, we are a small tribe. And these Americans, they want to interfere with our religion they should not do it because we are sons of the father, the son. He who goes there, pointing to the son, that is our father. We must help him daily to rise over the horizon and to walk over heaven. And we don't do it for ourselves only. We do it for America. We do it for the whole world. Did you follow? Jung understood that to many in the modern day, this statement would sound crazy and archaic. But he further noticed that members of the tribe did not suffer like we suffer. They were not infected by neurotic anxiety disorders or depression. This tribe was composed of highly functional individuals who saw themselves as fulfilling their duty as an actor in a divine drama of life. And their lives were rich in meaning and purpose. Or as Jung wrote, these people have no problems. They have their daily life their symbolic life. They get up in the morning with a feeling of their great and divine responsibility. They are the sons of the son. The father and their daily duty is to help the father over the horizon. Not for themselves alone, but for the whole world. You should see these fellows. They have a natural, fulfilled dignity. Isn't it beautiful? Jung contrasts this way of life 
with a Western woman he met. This lady, as Jung notes, was a compulsive traveler. Hey, who doesn't like to travel? <laughs> but she was a compulsive traveler, always running from one place to the next, always seeking, always seeking, but never really finding what she was looking for. I was amazed, he says, when I look at her eyes, the eyes of a hunted, a concerned animal, seeking, seeking, always in the hope of something, she's possessed. And why is she possessed? Because she does not live the life that makes sense. Hers is a life utterly, grotesquely banal, with not point in it at all, with no, no point in it at all. If she dies today, nothing has happened, nothing has vanished, because she was nothing. <sighs> kind of a strong, huh? That's why it's good. <laughs> <laughs> no matter where we go, the situational happiness is always relative. Every situation has two sides. One is fine and the other it's not. By changing a situation, we cannot resolve the problem of sadness. We are compulsive seekers. We are wanting people, and sometimes we don't even know what we want. We cannot give up the conclusion, I am a wanting person. Just cannot. I can only be, it can only be forgotten. It can only be forgotten. So what we generally try to do is to forget ourselves. How do we do that? Let's go to Hawaii. How about that? <laughs> mm -hmm. Spending a lot of money and time to forget ourselves, which is what happens exactly when you are happy. When you are happy, you forget yourselves. You forget what defines you. I will come to it. What is this compulsive seeking? This compulsive seeking that infects the whole world, what is it? What is this madness? <laughs> the stuff that we want in our lives is of two types. Things that you look upon as desirable and you don't have. You simply don't have. Money, comfort, progeny. And as mentioned before, these are problems where the, solu the solution lies outside. You make plans and effort Anything that appears very desirable at the moment, it becomes a thing to be achieved. True? Then we seek for things, objects that you consider desirable, but for objects that you have, but you think you don't have. Is it clear? The first seeking, you, you desire objects that you don't have. The second one, you desire objects that you think you don't have, but you have them. Example, Swami? Sure. Has it ever happened to you that you start looking for the pen? Where did I put the pen? Where did I put the pen? 
and it was right here. <laughs> Against your earlobes, it happened to me. I felt so silly. <laughs> Sometimes I get obsessed. It cannot happen to me. I just, <laughs> it has to be somewhere. It was right here before me. Yeah, it was here all the time. Or what are my glasses? They were here. Hmm? Here the problem, I was the problem and I was the solution. Hmm? The seeking was created by mere ignorance. You just forgot and you didn't know. Hmm? So what do we want? What do we seek? Again, let us get a dose of analytical or psychological insight, as Jung put it. Something that we ought to do all the time in our lives. To stop and think what's going on. With a pen in hand. Mm -hmm. And a notebook. A journal. We are constantly, as if, running after something. To acquire something. Or to get rid of something. Some run from one destination to another. Some chase romantic partners. Others are compulsive seeker, seekers of money, prestige, fame, or recognition. You can find that in the social media these days. Whatever it is, the underlying motivation seems to be the same. To run away from the banality of our existence. We want to feel fresh and original all the time. We are seeking to fill the void of emptiness that comes from living a meaningless life. In the light of Carl Jung, he explains this void cannot be filled with things or even experiences. What fills this void is knowing that we are living in a way that makes a difference. What fills this void is knowing that we are living in a way that really makes a difference. Or as he writes concerning the woman he met, remember? But if she could say, I am the daughter of the moon. Every night I must help the moon, my mother, over the horizon. Ah, that is something else. Then she lives. Then her life makes sense. And makes sense in all continuity and for the whole of humanity. That gives peace when people feel that they are living as actors in the divine drama. Because it is a divine drama. Accept it. That gives the only meaning to human life. That means the meaning to human life. Everything else is banal. And you can dismiss it. A career, producing children, are all Maya. You know what Maya is. Compare with that one thing, that your life is meaningful. Jung was not suggesting that we all adopt the Pueblo and mythology. Rather, his point is that many people suffer because their lives make no sense. And the task, for those, the task for those who want to be free of anxiety or depression is to discover this sense. We must, in other words, find a way to justify our existence, 
so that we, like the pueblo, the tribe, can believe that our life is meaningful. For some, this can be accomplished through religion, through communities contributing to the promotion of values in life, charity, or simply unselfish work. Looks like a good solution to the banality of life is to discover how we can play a meaningful role in the divine drama of life. Jung says, I am only concerned with the fulfillment of that which is in every individual. Only concerned with the fulfillment of that which is in every individual. That is the whole problem. That is the problem of the true Pueblo. That I do today everything that is necessary so that my father can rise over the horizon. Speaking of fulfillment, I love that word, Purna in Sanskrit. What are, what are our urges as wanting living beings that we are, that can make us feel fulfilled? Human beings want, what do we want? We want to live. We don't want to die. We don't want to even think about death. Not today. Maybe tomorrow, sometime. I don't know. <laughs> what about aging? Get out of here. <laughs> I don't want to age. But it's inevitable. We want to live. And that's not enough. I am alive here and now. There is a natural love to be. So I want to live, and I want to live happily. That is the second thing that we want. We want to live happily. It's a powerful urge. Another thing, what happens to us when, to us when we come to know something. Hey, didn't you hear that the other day? Something. Oh, really? What else? Tell me more. I want to know everything. We want to know everything now. Hmm? The moment you come to know a little bit, that's it. You have a problem. You want to know all. <laughs> you want to get rid of your ignorance. Hmm? That ignorance is bliss should be complete. Otherwise, there is no end to our want to know everything. All our activities in life are towards fulfilling these three natural urges. That I want to live, I want to live happily, and I want to know everything. These activities should be should keep away these activities, whatever we do, should keep away the thought that we are mortals and that we will eventually die. There are indeed activities that make us happier than what we are. Must, many of you must be thinking, well, Swami, don't be so negative. Of course, there are activities that make us happy. I mean, I love snowboarding, I don't know, skydiving. <laughs> I may say who doesn't, but many of you may disagree with me, but hey, who doesn't like reading or jogging or anything, right? That makes you feel good. Going for a walk, walking your dog. Hmm? There are definitely activities that make you feel happy. We feel we are incomplete and so there is an attempt to be free from incompleteness. Yet, we come to the conclusions, we are mortals, we are unhappy and incomplete, and we are ignorant. 
what does Vedanta say about sadness, Dukkha? The feeling of not being fulfilled. Hmm? Vedanta says the problem of sadness is centered in the eye. What eye? The eye. When I ask you, who are you? All of you, the first word will be I. I am so and so. The problem is centered in the I, Vedanta says. I am sad is only solved when I see the I as other than sad, as free from sadness. What? <laughs> yes, let me explain. I am sad is solved only when I see the I as other than sad. If the world makes you sad, then it stands to reason that the same world must also make you happy. Hmm? Think about it. In the same way, if I say I am bound, then I must be free. Because I know I am bound. If there is bondage, if there is bondage in the I sense, there alone in the I itself should be freedom. It's very subtle. If there is bondage in the I sense, there alone in the I itself should be freedom. That freedom has to be centered in the your I. It cannot be outside you. It has to be you. The problem is not sadness or sorrow. Is when I say, I am sad. When you define sadness as you. Human beings and animals experience sadness and sorrow. But animals don't say, I am happy, I am sad. The dog doesn't have the notion, I am happy. The dog doesn't have the complex, I am a lucky dog. I am a special. I have a great master. He feeds me every day. They do feel pleasure and pain like us, but they don't have the notion that defines themselves. The notion to define themselves. Like us. We immediately, after experiencing a situation, we define ourselves. Oh, now, that's it. I'm depressed. Dogs can be depressed, no doubt, if they don't stay active, but they don't say, I'm depressed. Animals don't have that complex, I am superior, I belong to a royal family. In short, they don't have self-judgment. They don't have the notion of self-judgment centering themselves. Do you think a chihuahua will say, I'm such a small dog? And when he sits himself in the mirror, he says, Oh, I'm ugly too. <laughs> <laughs> Who does that? Humans. Humans. We are conditioned by the world. Human beings have self judgment centered in their I sense. Therefore, they develop complexes. Like, I have a big nose, I'm fat, I'm small, and this and that. 
the list goes on and on. Human beings are conditioned by the world, are bound by the world. It's a problem that we depend upon many things for our security and happiness. We are limited and conditioned by the world. I think it's pretty clear, right? <laughs> but if I am unhappy arises from the world, if I am unhappy arises from the world. If I am unhappy is due to the world because it limits me, then I should be sad all the time. I should always be bound and sorrowful. However, as I mentioned before, in spite of being unhappy due to the world, we do feel happy sometimes, occasionally. We say, today is a great day. Mm -hmm. In spite of the possible default here in the United States, it's a good day. The world is the same. I haven't changed the color of my eyes didn't get any taller. Yeah, it's a good day. Guess what? I'm happy. The problem of sadness has nothing to do with the external world. The problem of sadness is centered in our notion of I. You are the problem when I say, when you say, I am sad. And you are the solution when you start laughing and say, I'm happy. I was reading the news the other day. Yes, I read the news. I listen to the news sometimes. And um, I ran into this article, poor Johnny Depp. I mean, <laughs> apparently the guy, after so many years, he showed up, you know. He came back and made a public appearance. And he looked good, the articles. He looks great. However, he made a mistake. He showed his teeth. He laughed in front of the camera. So people, actually, they didn't like the color of his teeth. They were yellow. <laughs> so he was thrilled, you know, thrilled in the internet, and um, yeah, some people posted that with those yellow teeth, he indeed looked like Captain Jack Sparrow, for real, you know? He was one of his characters in one of his movies, he was a pirate. Hmm? Pointing out that Johnny's teeth were literally rotting. So that called my attention. I was like, oh, poor guy. And then I look at the picture. Oh, yeah, they look, they look yellow. You know, definitely no Photoshop there. <laughs> <laughs> so imagine poor Johnny Depp. After reading this post, he definitely felt sad. And I'm sure he would try to hide his teeth from the camera next time until he fixed them. I don't know. Mm, but what happens if somebody makes him laugh in front of the camera? Huh? He would laugh out loud, completely oblivious of his flaw. Spontaneously, he would laugh. But when he remembers that, he will close his mouth. That's what happens to us when we forget ourselves. We forget what we choose to define us, that which defines us, and we become truly who we are, free. Do you see it? There are two verses, chapter number six, verse number five and six, 
उत्वरेदात्मनात्मानम नात्मानम अवसादयेत आत्मैव ही आत्मनो बंधु हो आत्मैव ही पुरात्मना हा फ्रॉम द बागवत गीता ए मैन शुड अपलिफ्ट हिमसेल्फ बाय हिस ओन सेल्फ सो लेट हिम नॉट वीकन दिस सेल्फ फॉर दिस सेल्फ इज द फ्रेंड ऑफ वन सेल्फ एंड दिस सेल्फ is the enemy of oneself and then it goes the self the active part of our nature is the friend of the self for him who has conquered himself by this self but not the unconquered self this self is inimical harmful and behaves like an external foe the notion of self judgment is the problem do you see it now and we do that to ourselves all the time mind means your notion about yourself your conclusion about yourself your mind the solution to this problem life in what capital self clarity clarity knowledge you should know who you are true vedantins affirm yourselves the upanishads the end of the vedas we find these tiny little books in sanskrit there we find the answers to these fundamental questions of life they say you are free already in deep sleep in the moment of happiness i do give up all the notions that make me feel small and limited i find myself happy when those notions are absent if i am confined by the physical body which keeps changing keeps aging and is subject to death death if i take myself to be the body i become immortal i limit myself when i am free all the time but all limitations are objects of my knowledge the sun exists what is the sun behind the clouds because of what because i exist you guys exist because i exist you can say the same about this no problem no offense <laughs> nobody is special here it's our experience the world is an object i am the subject the world exists because i exist when you cease to exist the world will disappear the physical body exists because i exist the body is fat beautiful strong weak etc because i exist if all this is known then who is the knower When I say I'm tall, I'm looking at myself from the standpoint of the body. When I say I'm a father, I'm a son, I'm a wife, you are looking at yourself from different standpoints that define you in different roles in life. These are all notions. And they are all about yourself. The notions that you choose to define yourself the problem is that the point of view becomes the view they become the vision of the self they become the knowledge upon the self there is nothing wrong in saying this body is an object 
There is nothing wrong in saying, my car, my body. Would you say, I am the car? Clearly not, it's so obvious, right? You drive the car. So who is driving this body? Stop saying I'm the body. That's an object. Yeah, keep it healthy, maintain it, you know. Tune up every once in a while. To the doctor. Exercise, healthy life, of course. But you can't say that you are the body. The problem arises when you identify yourself with the body. You become immortal, and you may be immortal from the standpoint of the body, you may be blind from the standpoint of the senses, you may be restless from the standpoint of the mind, and wanting in knowledge from the standpoint of your intellect. The problem is you are mortal, restless, ignorant, sinner, and so on. There are so many complexes, complexes that arise when you look at yourself from different standpoints. But from the standpoint of the I, that is aware of this body, is aware of the senses, is aware of your emotions, knowledge, memories, what are you? Who are you? Look at yourself from the standpoint of the I. What is this I? When you look at it, you can only say, I am a conscious being. I am a person who is aware of my existence. Inevitably. Are you here? Well, you are. So, yeah. How do you know? Hey, I'm here. Don't you see? You are aware of your existence here and now. Do you require any proof? If I ask you, what is this? You may say a microphone or a flower. Hmm? How do you know? You say, Swami, I see it. Don't you see it? So you know things that are existent and non-existent. Now if I ask you, do you exist or not? I have no doubt that you exist. How do you know you exist? You exist because everything else requires proof for its existence, whereas you require no proof. The existence of everything is proven because you exist. If you needed proof of your existence, you would have no knowledge. I is self-evident. I is simply consciousness. Consciousness is ananta, limitless, in terms of space and time. The physical body, on the other hand, is in time mortal, subject to change. But when time is, consciousness is. But there is no time between two thoughts. There is no time when you are in ecstasy. There is no time in sleep. Yet, you are conscious all the time. No interruption, no limits, constantly conscious. Everything, time and space exist in consciousness, which is exactly what our scriptures say. God, consciousness is everywhere. You can't escape that. You can't escape yourselves.
Sounds good, huh? <laughs> Happiness is in spite of unfulfilled desires. We are always wanting people. As a kid we were, as an adult we are, hmm? and yet we are happy sometimes, as I mentioned. There are moments that keep your life, these moments, these tiny little bits of happiness, keeps you going. They are there for a reason. However, you gather this moment, these moments not by fulfilling all your desires, do you? You gather them just, you know, you got lucky. <laughs> you feel good today. Hmm? They are in spite of fulfilling all your desires. You gather them in spite of them, of your desires. The world does not disappear when you are happy. It's very much there. All the problems, politics and this and that. When I am happy at that moment, the world is. The senses are. The mind is. And I'm very much present here and now. My situation has not changed and complaints have not gone anywhere. The problems have not been solved yet. I am happy today. What does it mean? It only means at any moment when I am happy, guess what? You are not a seeker. When you are happy, you stopped wanting. Didn't you notice that? When you are happy, you don't want anything. Everything is perfect. What happens in a moment of joy? You cease to seek. There is no division between the world and you. The secret thought division disappears at that very moment. There is no judgment about the self. How lonely I am, how good I am, how worthless I am, how ugly and so on. Such conclusions are completely forgotten. You completely forgot your high, your faults, anything. Suddenly you become one with the world. You don't want anything. Pain, pain, dukkha in Sanskrit is not the problem. I am sad is the problem. Bondage is not the problem. I am bound is the problem. I am the problem and therefore I am the solution. The solution lies within me. I need to seek within myself. I need to find the answers within me. I need to contemplate upon this. The I. How you define your I is the solution to this. Give me two more minutes. Suppose you're in a beautiful place. Imagine one of those scenes from the Avatar movie. Perfect. I don't know if you saw it. You were like, wow, this looks so beautiful. No? Perfect place. The luxury of nature all around you, mountains, greenery. Everything is perfect. The place is clean and the people are good strange. Everything is beautiful and you find yourself happy. Do you know why? It's beautiful. It's because you don't want the mountains to be different. You don't want the colors of the sky to be different. You don't want the river to look different. You don't want the stones around you to be different. You don't want your body to be different. You simply are.
you just are. Are you not? You don't want to change anything. Every time we are unhappy, we want. We want to change. You accept yourself totally because you find yourself acceptable. The I is but consciousness. It is already full, limitless. You are limitless because consciousness is limitless. Ananda in Sanskrit, which means nothing but ananda, bliss. It is limitless. The fullness that I, I am, that I experience in different degrees. I am limited, limitless time-wise, and so I am not mortal. I am limit, limitless space-wise, and so I am not incomplete. I am consciousness that illumines both knowledge and ignorance, and so I am neither knowledgeable nor ignorant. I am already what I am to be. I am already what I want to be, free from death, incompleteness, free from ignorance. I am the very solution to my problem. The problem is centered on the I, and the solution is centered on that very I as well, the reality of which is entirely different from what you take it to be. Therefore, the solution lies in the very problem. It is not outside the problem. We identify the problem and the solution. The problem is not the fact of life, the ups and downs of life, the limitations of life, but the notion about ourselves based on our experience. Carl Jung says, I am not what happened to me. I am what I choose to become. For me, Thomas Merton says, to be a saint means to be myself. Therefore, the problem of sanctity and salvation is in fact the problem of finding out who I am and of discovering my true self. For me, to be a saint means to be myself. Therefore, the problem of sanctity and salvation is, not, is in fact the problem of finding out who I am and of discovering my true self. We need to redefine ourselves. We need to be who we truly are. Thank you. Om Pur Namadaf Pur Namidam Pur Nat Pur Namudachyate Pur Nasya Pur Namadaya Pur Name Vabashishyate Om Shanti 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 Om, that outer world is Purna, full of divine consciousness. This inner world is also Purna, full of divine consciousness. From Purna comes Purna, from fullness of divine consciousness, the world is manifested. Taking Purna from Purna, Purna indeed remains, because divine consciousness is non-dual and infinite. Om, peace.
বলো গো ঠাকুর বলো না রে বলো গো ঠাকুর বলো না রে আনিলে এ কারে সাথে তোমার বলো গো ঠাকুর বলো না রে আনিলে এ কারে সাথে তোমার ব্রহ্মতে দীপ্ত আন ব্রহ্মতে দীপ্ত আন পুরুষ সিংহ কে কুমার আনিলে এ কারে সাথে তোমার বলো গো ঠাকুর বলো না মারে আনিলে এ কারে সাথে তোমার বীরে সর অমিত বীর্য সুর সেনাপতি যিনি আসৌর্য বীরে সর অমিত বীর্য সুর সেনাপতি যিনি আসৌর্য জ্ঞানী গরিয়ান তপস প্রধান জ্ঞানী গরিয়ান তপস প্রধান প্রেমে ভাসমান নয়ন তার আনিলে এ কারে সাথে তোমার বলো গো ঠাকুর বলো না রে আনিলে এ কারে সাথে তোমার ত্যাগে সুখদেব প্রেমেতে নারদ বুদ্ধের মত হৃদয় তার জ্ঞানে শিব গুরু শঙ্কর সম সে কেন লুটায় পদে তোমার ত্যাগে সুখদেব প্রেমেতে নারদ বুদ্ধের মত হৃদয় যার জ্ঞানে শিব গুরু শঙ্কর সম সে কেন লুটায় পদে তোমার হুঙ্কারে যান কাঁপে ত্রিভুবন সে কেন মাগিছে তোমার স্মরণ হুঙ্কারে যার কাঁপে ত্রিভুবন সে কেন মাগিছে তোমার স্মরণ তোমারই আশিস করিয়া ধারণ তোমারই আশিস করিয়া ধারণ সে কি গো হরিবে ধরার ভার তোমারই আশিস করিয়া ধারণ সে কি গো হরিবে ধরার ভার আনিলে এ কারে সাথে তোমার বলো গো ঠাকুর বলো না রে আনিলে এ কারে সাথে তোমার ব্রহ্মতে দীপ্ত আন ব্রহ্মতে দীপ্ত আন পুরুষ সিংহ কে কুমার আনিলে এ কারে সাথে তোমার বলো গো ঠাকুর বলো না রে আনিলে এ কারে সাথে তোমার আনিলে এ কারে সাথে তোমার নমশ্রী যতি রাজায় বিবেকানন্দ সুরয় সচ্চিত সুখস্বরূপায় স্বামিনী তাপহারি উই অফার অর প্রণাম টু দ্যাট স্বামী বিবেকানন্দ হু ওয়ান্টেড টু রিমেইন কমপ্লিটলি অ্যাবজর্বড ইন দ্য ব্লিস অফ সচ্চিৎ আনন্দ অ্যান্ড হু হিমসেলফ ইজ দ্যাট উই অফার অর প্রণাম টু দ্যাট স্বামী
Sachidanand who removes the suffering of all of us. Jai Mahatma.